I normally talk about people who are very, very, very obscure. But today I will be talking about a libertarian thinker who's actually a household name, Frederick Bastiat. I have a confession. Today's episode is really me repaying a debt to Bastiat. You see, back in the day when I first started college, Bastiat was one of the first great liberal writers whose arguments were written as they were in such an accessible style made me delve deeper into libertarianism. So I own a cheeky episode. With all this said, let's get to the man himself. Bastiat has a host of famous short articles explaining economic principles and is an amazingly easy to read book called The Law. Most libertarians will have some form of contact with Bastiat by reading his books or by seeing his pithy quotations online or by spotting his books being handed out at events, etc. You get it. Bastiat is not very obscure. But usually these books do not delve into Bastiat's personal life and give only a very brief introduction to who he is. This is a great shame, as Bastiat's works are for the most part read in isolation from his life and the influences that shape the charm and individuality for which his work is rightly recognized and admired for. Bastiat's involvement with politics was a deeply personal affair, as he observed throughout his life firsthand the ineffectiveness of ham-fisted government policies. Younger people tend to be more radical. When a person first comes politically involved, they tend to have stronger radical opinions which slowly become more and more moderate over time. Bastiat was the exact opposite of this phenomenon. He started out as an economics nerd who believed in free trade and thought it was a beneficial influence. But once he began applying the principles of free trade elsewhere, he began to realize the state must be drastically limited in all aspects of life, including religion, art, leisure, the workplace, and education. By the end of his life, Bastiat produced The Law, the book for which he is most well known today, which describes his radical idea for a minimal state which protects the rights of individuals and leaves the rest to voluntary associations, free markets, and individual action. The Bastiat family had, for generations, been a family who traditionally made their living through trade, international trade to be exact. Bastiat's great-grandfather had opened a trading business, and following this tradition, Bastiat's grandfather opened his own business in Bayonne, with the help of his son Pierre, Bastiat's father. Since 1784, Bayonne had been made a free port, which was a rarity at the time, when protectionist trade barriers were being erected all over France. Bastiat's father and grandfather were able to freely trade with Spain, Portugal and Holland, leading the family's rising prosperity. It is unsurprising that later in life, Bastiat would stress the importance of international trade, considering it was effectively in his blood at this point. Bastiat's father married in 1800 and had two children, a son and a daughter, one being Bastiat. Bastiat's sister tragically died shortly after she was born, leaving Bastiat as an only child. Though the early years of Bastiat's life were comfortable, the Bastiat family fortune began to decline as Napoleon's conflicts made trading internationally a near impossible feat. When Bastiat was just nine years of age, both of his parents caught tuberculosis and died, and the unfortunate Bastiat was raised by his grandfather and Aunt Justine, who became a devoted mother figure for him. Importantly, Justine noticed how gifted the young Bastiat was and decided he ought to be sent to a good school to match his natural abilities. In 1814, she sent him to an extremely prestigious high school at Ceres, run by two brothers, who were dedicated to progressive educational reforms that would make a deep impact upon the outlook and writings of Bastiat later in life. There were three main areas of reform which should impact Bastiat's worldview. Firstly, the school enrolled pupils from a wide variety of religious and cultural backgrounds to cultivate a cosmopolitan environment where toleration was promoted. The second important reform was the modernization of languages. Throughout Europe, and especially America in the 18th and 19th centuries, educational curricula were heavily focused on Greek and Latin. Students were expected to read the best ancient world had to offer, including authors such as Cicero, Plato, Tacitus, and Plutarch. Students were expected to read, translate, and speak Greek and Latin hardly the most universal or applicable skill. Bastiat's school instead opted to focus on modern languages such as German, English, Spanish, and Italian. This led students like Bastiat to look more forward into future developments in fields such as science, mathematics, and most importantly for Bastiat, economics. As opposed to reading the same hallowed text repetitively, students were encouraged to pursue extracurricular activities as well, such as sports and music. Bastiat took part in sprinting and riding, while also learning to play the cello, a hobby he would keep up throughout his life. The last and important innovative reform was that collaboration was encouraged. Students were encouraged to work together instead of working as isolated or atomistic individuals. Bastiat and one of his friends, Victor, worked together in 1818 to win first place in the poetry contest, for example. In short, Bastiat thrived in this environment of toleration, modernity, and collaboration. He seemingly deeply enjoyed his education, which makes it all the sadder that he was never able to complete it in full. When he was 17, he had to leave his studies to help his uncle with the family business back in Bayonne. But Bastiat never stopped learning. He was a lifelong learner who never rested on his laurels, always reading about new fields, ideas, and developments. 
Returning to Bayonne, Bastiat saw a once thriving port in terminal decline due to excessive protectionism, which had been enforced since 1815 with the restored French monarchy. It was during this period of his life that Bastiat was introduced to the economists Adam Smith and Jean Baptiste Say. By 1824, Bastiat's grandfather had died, and Bastiat inherited agricultural land in Saint Gris, which was rented out to sharecroppers. This newfound wealth gave Bastiat time and independence to pursue his studies. By 1830, the monarchy of Charles X had been overthrown by the July Revolution, which replaced one monarch with another, more particularly, Louis Philippe I. Bastiat, although a Republican and a supporter of democracy, eventually rallied behind the July Revolutionaries, supporting the new constitutional monarchy. Following the revolution, Bastiat decided he wanted a shifted career into politics. But he would need more wealth to achieve this, and so he married a wealthy heiress named Clotilde Hirard. Bastiat rarely if ever mentions his wife throughout his personal letters, giving the impression that their marriage was really one out of convenience more than love. Bastiat looked after Clotilde financially, but besides this, there was no particular evidence of a romantic connection with her. In the same year he married, Bastiat began his political career as Justice of the Peace, a position in which he mediated disputes in the county of Magron, a small but industrious port on the Ardua River, which had a population of around 2,000 people. Despite lacking any sort of legal education, Bastiat had an excellent reputation as an efficient worker who always appealed to common sense. Through his work as an excellent justice of the peace, Bastiat became one of the model citizens of Morgan, leading swiftly to his election as general councillor for the county. During his time as a general councillor, Bastiat fought ardently against the excessive taxation on wine and liquor. By this point in his life, Bastiat was in favour of free trade thanks to the teachings of Say and Smith, but he was not yet a radical thinker or activist. The event that would trigger Bastiat from increasingly radical was the opportune introduction of the Anti-Corn Law League. In 1844, while chatting at a popular club where educated bourgeois members discussed politics, philosophy and economics, one of the club members complained about a speech which he had read by the British Prime Minister Robert Peel. This club member complained that Peel had jabbed at France, but he actually didn't, and only appeared to do so in mistranslation in French. While trying to track down this speech, Bastiat stumbled upon the Anti-Corn Law League, a free trade movement in England which advocated for abolishing taxes on imported wheat. The Anti-Corn Law League was special in that it was a grassroots movement which advocated for free trade by arguing that it would raise the standards of living for the poorest in society, a bleeding heart argument. Bastiat was inspired by the successes of the Anti-Corn Law League and decided he would follow in their footsteps by starting a similar movement in France. His first effort towards this was an article entitled On the Influence of French and English Tariffs on the Future of Two Peoples. In it, Bastiat argued that England's move towards free trade would allow him to enjoy increasing prosperity, while France's growth was constrained by protectionism. To his own surprise, his article was published by a leading economics journal, and Bastiat was quickly invited to Paris to further pursue his research. Bastiat was reluctant to leave Magron, to which he had grown deeply attached. But, in this period, Paris was where the action was intellectually, and so he decided to move there in 1845. Despite his provincial upbringing, in Paris, Bastiat was thought by many to be an endlessly charming and interesting conversationalist. Before establishing a campaign in France for free trade, Bastiat decided to travel to England to meet the leading figure of the anti corn League, Richard Cobden. Bastiat and Cobden were kindred spirits and became lifelong friends, corresponding with each other for years after. Upon returning to France, he began publishing articles on the benefits of free trade. These articles were published for a variety of journals and papers and were eventually compiled together to make a book that we know today as Economic Sophisms. Economics is not a field known for its accessible prose and entertaining anecdotes, especially in Bastiat's day when economics books were dry and long. If you don't believe me, go and read Bastiat's favourite economists, Say and Smith. But Bastiat is famous today for his amazingly accessible, but most of all entertaining writings, such as economic sophisms, which explain core concepts in an incredibly witty manner. I can't go through all of Bastiat's writings here, of course, so I'll give a brief overview of my personal favourite small essay he has, which explains the benefits of free trade and the absurdity of protectionism. By 1845, the French government had raised a variety of tariffs on all kinds of goods in an attempt to promote industry at home. Bastiat wished to show the absurdity of this idea, so he decided to write a satirical open letter to Parliament in which he pretends to be a person representing, and I quote, manufacturers of candles, tapers, lanterns, sticks, street lamps, snuffers, extinguishers, and producers of tallow, oil, resin, alcohol, and generally everything connected with lighting. Many protectionists had argued that there was unfair competition from abroad, with French producers having to compete with cheap goods flooding in from other countries, and that therefore, the government ought to erect barriers to trade such as tariffs to protect domestic industries. Bastiat wanted to show how ridiculous this proposition was, that it really favoured producers over consumers. To illustrate this, 
he took the protectionist logic to its extreme. If we really want to promote the industries connected to lighting, the greatest competitor is not foreign producers, but in fact, the sun itself. If the French government would only pass a law forcing people to never open their curtains, shutters, or windows, the French government could greatly increase the amount of lighting-related products needed. The candlestick maker's petition would not help everyone. In reality, it would only benefit those who make candles, of course. Everyone else would have to buy more candles, lowering their disposable income, despite the cheaper alternative of the sun, which is free. Basquiat argues that tariffs operate much in the same principle as this ridiculous proposal. Using tariffs to protect uncompetitive industries increases costs for everyone to the benefit of the producer. Reminding Parliament of all the tariffs they have passed long before, Basquiat ends the petition by saying, Make your choice, but be logical. For as long as you ban, as you do, foreign coal, iron, wheat, and textiles in proportion as their price approaches zero, how inconsistent it would be to emit the light of the sun whose price is zero all day long. In short, protectionism benefits producers over consumers, and more to the point, protectionism bestows special privileges on few at the expense of the many. Bastiat's rhetorical flourish comes from pushing protectionist ideas to their logical extremes, therefore just showing how bizarre they are in reality. Most importantly, he expresses complex economic ideas in a manner which is lighthearted, intuitive, and memorable. If nothing else, Bastiat was an unparalleled disseminator of ideas, which was an important skill Bastiat made use of as he further dedicated himself to the burgeoning French free trade movement, acting as a general secretary and editor of a weekly paper. But despite their best efforts, French free marketeers had little success in following their British counterparts. Bastiat theorized that, unlike the English, the French were not acclimated to rallies and public debate. He decided instead that he would influence policy through electoral politics. In 1846, he ran for election for a position of a Chamber of Deputies. In his election manifesto, Bastiat explained that he was for a government with strictly limited scope of law enforcement and defense. In all other areas of life, leaving people alone would produce the goods and services necessary for flourishing life. He warned against excessive government intervention and spending, which he believed was ever-expanding and was constraining growth and progress. But disappointingly, Bastiat was not elected. But thanks to the constantly changing nature of French politics, Bastiat was quickly given another chance to enter an influential position in politics, when the July monarchy was overthrown in 1848, and replaced with the Second French Republic. By 1849, Bastiat had been elected to the Legislative Assembly, where he worked tirelessly, balancing his job as a member of parliament with writing pamphlets and working on his longer, more theoretical works, all while he suffered from tuberculosis, which made public speaking a difficult and at times painful task. While working in politics, he never aligned wholly with the right or the left. Instead, he voted with his conscience and what he believed in. This led Jean-Baptiste Say, grandson, to describe Bastiat as a person with too strong a personality to be a complete politician. A core principle of Bastiat's political thrust was that laissez-faire would best promote the interests and prosperity of the poorest. For example, in a speech from 1849, Bastiat would argue against taxes on wine, pleasing those on the right with free trade but also arguing that these taxes unfairly burden the poorest through higher prices. For this, Bastiat received praise from both the right and the left. In another speech from the same year, Bastiat opposed laws which would restrict workers' rights to form a union. Bastiat explained that people have the right to peacefully associate with whom they wished and to push for better conditions. Bastiat never took a particular side, but he was always above partisan behaviour, and because of this, Bastiat nearly always found himself voting with the minority, leading to little in the way of concrete free market policies. Bastiat's two most important and influential works were written in 1850. One is a short article entitled That Which Is Seen and That Which Is Not Seen, and the other is a brief but direct book called The Law. That Which Is Seen and That Which Is Not Seen begins with Bastiat explaining that a bad economist only observes the immediate effects of an action or policy, while a good economist will take into account not only what is immediate, but also the long-term effects of a policy. Bastiat tells the story of a baker whose son accidentally breaks one of his shop's windows. He explains that in situations like this, there was normally one person who would say something along the lines of, well, if no windows were ever broken, how would glaziers make a living? But Bastiat explains that this nonchalant comment actually it contains an entire theory. The broken window is fixed by the glazier, who happily accepts the payment. This is only what is seen, though. Bastiat explains that many believe it is a good thing for money to circulate and change hands. Therefore, it might actually be a good thing that windows are broken. Bastiat explains that those who come to this conclusion confine their analysis only to the immediate and obvious effects, which are seen. But if the baker's window had not been broken, he could have spent his money on a new pair of shoes or a new suit, which would have stimulated other productive industries. 
This all sounds pretty obvious. Today we might call it opportunity cost in economics. But Basquiat applies this principle to a plethora of situations, the most striking of which is the disbanding of armies and the effects of taxation. Firstly, let's look at Bastiat on disbanding the troops. In Bastiat's day, many politicians were really anxious about disbanding parts of the military, returning soldiers to civilian life. Politicians reasoned that if a large number of soldiers return from the workforce, there would be anarchy as people search for jobs. So even if there's no use for some people in the army, many believe it would just be better to keep soldiers employed by the state to avoid the scramble for work that would ensue when they're discharged. But Bastiat explained that the money required to maintain these soldiers would now be returned to the taxpayer, who in turn would spend it, stimulating the economy and creating more demand for goods and thus more jobs. Bastiat summarized that the whole difference consists in this. Before the disbanding, the country gave 100 million to 100,000 men for doing nothing. And after that, it pays them the same sum for working. If there is no reason for a large military, it should be disbanded. If the military is kept, the taxpayer pays money towards the upkeep of the soldier for no benefits. Now let us turn our attention to taxes. Bastiat warns against the idea that there is no better investment than taxes. He explains that services taxes provide are easily seen. What is unseen is how a taxpayer could have spent their money to buy useful goods while also stimulating productive industries. But government can only attain revenue by taxing those who work productively. As long as the services the government provides are efficient for the populace at large, this shouldn't be an issue. But governments being governments, this is often not the case. There are huge amounts of tax that go to waste. Money that could have been used to taxpayers to buy goods and services they'd actually wanted in the first place, while also stimulating productive industries that satisfy consumer demands better than any government policy ever could. In 2019, the American government defense budget ran roughly $700 billion. The benefit average Americans gain from excessive numbers of jet fighters, guns, and tanks is not immediately apparent. The law was one of Bastiat's last and most renowned works in which he describes what the law ought to be, in a moral sense. Bastiat believed that every human being possessed the three God-given rights of individuality, liberty, and property, and that these three gifts exist before any human legislation. All human laws exist to protect our God-given rights. According to Bastiat, every person has the right of defending, even by force, his person, his liberty, and his property. Groups of people band together collectively to more effectively defend their rights, but their collective nature does not allow them to ever violate individual rights. Bastiat staunchly maintains that collective rights, lawfulness, is always based on the original right of individuals, and that it cannot reasonably be extended beyond this task. Therefore, Bastiat concludes that nothing, therefore, can be more evident than this. The law is the organization of the natural rights of lawful defense. For Bastiat, the law is quite simply organized justice. It is not a tool to pursue any outcome, but justice, which is the absence of infringements upon people's natural rights. In his own words, Bastiat explains that it is not true that the function of the law is to regulate consciences, our wills, our ideas, our education, our opinions, our trade, our talents, our creations. Its function is to prevent one person from intervening or interfering with the rights of another in any of these matters. If people adhere to this definition of the law, Bastiat believed harmony, prosperity, and progress would reign supreme, with individuals freely cooperating with one another. But increasingly in France, the law is becoming an instrument of social policy, not merely preventing injustice, but intervening in the most minute aspects of life. The law has become disfigured, transformed into a wholly new, unrecognizable being. And Bastiat theorized that there were two urges that caused this perversion of law's proper end. Stupid greed and false philanthropy. Life can only be sustained and improved by unceasing application of one's skills, talents, and efforts. Or in more simple language, we have to work. But working is boring, painful, and time-consuming. Therefore, some people attempt to live at the expense of others by stealing what they have labored to create. This is what Bastiat calls plunder, the taking of what rightfully belongs to one person and appropriate for another. This can be solved by punishing those who plunder others. By making plunder less attractive than work, we can ensure harmony. But the real threat to our rights is not from petty thieves or bandits, but from actually the state itself, which sanctions what Bastiat calls lawful or legal plunder. He explains that laws are generally made by one man or one class of men. Invariably due to the fatal tendency that exists in human nature, those in power use the force of law for their own benefit. But as history progresses, more orders of society are enfranchised and given more of a say in politics. But this creates two different groups. Firstly, special interest groups, driven by greed, but also advocates of the less fortunate, motivated by false philanthropy. Both attempt to use the law and to go beyond its narrow scope and achieve broader ends. 
Bastiat chastises both of these urges and instead advises the population at large to stop using the law as a tool to achieve their own ends. The law can only pursue justice for all people. No particular groups or individuals can be catered to. The law must be general and applied to all people. France had been through a multitude of revolutions and counter-revolutions, all trying different ideologies. And Bastiat, almost in an exhaustive manner, comments on this, finishing the law by saying, now that legislators and do-gooders have so futilely inflicted so many systems upon society, may they finally end where they should have begun. May they reject all systems and try liberty. An idea nestled within the law that isn't really given too much attention is Bastiat's idea that the common person is perfectly capable of governing themselves and entitled to freedom. He condemned the socialists especially, who believe in constantly muddled lines between the state and society. He thought socialists assumed that these were one and the same, he argued that socialists inherited a way of thinking about politics that had been prevalent in the ancient world, a system of thinking in which mankind is merely inert matter, receiving life, organization, morality, and prosperity from the power of the state. The ancient way of thinking about politics and mankind had become prevalent thanks to the education system which venerated the Greeks and Romans. Bastiat believed enjoyed mass slavery and deemed commerce as a degrading activity. Bastiat showed that many French thinkers had inherited this flawed way of thinking about mankind, People says St. Just said the legislature commanded the future for the good of mankind. Rob Speer, who confidently asserted that the government existed to direct the moral and physical powers of the entire nation. And Le Pelletier, who believed we need to create a new people through a process of total regeneration through the state. Bastet rejected these thinkers as tyrants and loons. Every person is capable of governing him or herself. He asked, if the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it is not safe to permit people to be free, how is it that the tendencies of these organizers are always so good? Do the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the human race, or do they believe that they themselves are made of a finer clay than the rest of mankind? Bastiat is clear. No one has the right to organize and regiment how the human race ought to act. There is no need for some politician imbued with godlike powers to tell them how to act, think, or feel. We are all capable of making our own decisions. Sadly, the law is one of Bastiat's last works. His tuberculosis was debilitating, and by the fall of 1850, he was told to attempt to alleviate his symptoms in a warmer climate of Italy. But by the time Bastia had made it to Rome, he passed away in Christmas Eve of 1850. Overall, Bastia's work did not culminate much in the way of concrete reform, and Bastia might have been disappointed with that in his own life. But he would only be viewing what is seen, the immediate consequences of his life's work. What is unseen is the countless people he persuaded through clever arguments to not only support the free market, but freedom as a guiding principle in all human endeavors. I would know after all, I am one of his converts. Bastiat's works have garnered a huge amount of praise, mainly for their accessibility and unique style, which have never successfully been mimicked. Modern economists have lavished praise on Bastiat for making their discipline one for the layperson as well. The 20th century economist Joseph Schumpter would go on to call Bastiat the most brilliant economic journalist who ever lived. And in a similar manner, Mary Rothbard referred to him as a lucid and superb writer. Another two giants of libertarianism share appreciation for Bastiat. Frederick Hayek and Milton Friedman both commended the efforts of Bastiat. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Bastiat has received copious amounts of praise from eminent figures throughout the cohorts of libertarianism. And because of this, for many, Bastiat is the first encounter with libertarianism for a lot of people. And is a testament to his skill that he grabs the attention of so many, even to this day. Many of the authors I cover in this show write books which are compelling, but honestly, they're not always the easiest to read. But Bastiat is special. He is always a pleasure to read, which is why I found myself returning to his work even years after first reading it. Bastiat's writing is as important for the way he expresses his ideas as for the ideas themselves. I can't recommend reading Bastiat's original works enough. And with that said, I think my debt to Monsieur Bastiat is paid for now. Thanks a mil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.